violence is so preventable. It comes down For to many having... For many people, today is just Monday, but for people who were near this spot at 10th and K, this is a horrific reminder for what happened just a year ago. It was a day that forever changed their lives, and right now there is a vigil going on for honoring the victims who lost their lives in what is known as Sacramento's deadliest shooting. Now, tonight we are spending a big part of our show looking at the K Street shooting that happened, but first we want to take a look at how we got here. At 2 a.m. on Sunday, April 3rd, 2022, as many people were leaving bars and clubs, they ran for cover as gunfire echoed through the city streets. There was a fight on K Street, then a shootout. Emergency responders arrived on scene within minutes and declared what happened, a mass casualty incident. Five people were found dead at the corner of K and 10th Streets with multiple gunshot wounds, and a sixth person was found dead at 10th and J. The oldest victim was 57 years old. The youngest, just 21 years old, Yami Lee Martinez Andrade, who had just celebrated her birthday. She was a real loving person. You know, she'd do anything for anybody. Melinda Davis was also killed that day. She was an unhoused woman who slept on the sidewalk near the scene of the shooting. A photographer took her photo not long before she was killed. She's never been rowdy. She's always been kind. If you're a part of Midtown and you walk through there every day, you're just gonna, you're just gonna kind of miss her. As the capital city mourned those lost, a manhunt began for suspects. Police later said they believe there were five shooters from two gangs. Brothers Smiley and DeAndre Martin and Emtula Payton have since been charged with murder, among other charges. All three remain in the Sacramento County Jail and are expected in court again in June. So what now? The conversation the past year has been focused on not only how to make downtown safer, but also more attractive. But how do we address the problems that got us here in the first place? That's what investigative reporter Andy Judson has been looking into. He fell down to his head. He's bleeding profusely. We were clearing the area, trying to get people to comply with heading home. Night was over. A minute or two after that is when the shots started going off. And people started scattering in all different directions. The shooting left six dead and a dozen more injured. Downtown Sacramento went into panic as one of the deadliest shootings in Sacramento's history was unfolding. But to staff of popular K Street bars, the victims were familiar faces, even friends. One of the young ladies had been in the week before. Another of the young ladies who had lost their life, who was an innocent victim in it, had been in the night before. So that kind of hurts. Even those linked to the shooting had been at his bar 45 minutes prior to shots being fired. And one of the things that officers saw when they were reviewing the video is they saw that one of the, one of the people involved left at like 115, another one left at like 120. His security footage is part of the investigation and why we couldn't obtain this video. But what Ken saw sticks with him to this day. People you know, hiding on our video and everything. You could see them hiding behind trees, dropping to the ground, just laying flat, trying to make sure they weren't hit. Business did not recover for months. And I don't think K Street really started to recover until probably mid-August. A struggle on top of a tough couple of years. COVID hurt many K Street businesses. K Street has so many vacancies. The block over from us between 9th and 10th, I think there's one business open after 9 o'clock at night, which means there's no lighting up and no positive energy to help with the environment at night. A lack of lighting has also been an issue. It was a concern voiced in reoccurring meetings held after the shooting. There was meetings with the police and downtown SAC partnership and venues, and we kept pushing for lighting, and it took 10 months for it to happen. 
Um, unfortunately, those meetings aren't taking place anymore, so we don't have that direct communication. So we went to the Sacramento Nighttime Economy Manager, a new position created shortly after the shooting that works with businesses, residents, and various city departments to enhance our nighttime economy. And it's something that unfortunately kind of ebbs and flows when I first started doing this job. She says the city has hired consultants to do an assessment of K Street. And what that is, is really identifying our challenges and opportunities and seeing what we can do. We're getting a lot of feedback from different people, but we do need to do some things with our vacant spaces. She's looking to use vacant locations as venues for live music. Which would be really exciting because that adds vibrancy to the area, but it also helps our creative economy. But businesses we spoke with that did not want to go on camera told me they believe the city is not doing enough. But where we have seen change happen since the shooting is not here on K Street, but in various areas across the city. A lot of the violent crime in our city is committed in very small geographic areas and really um, just by a small handful of people. Data from police shows that 45% of violent crime in the city of Sacramento happens in just a few areas, like Oak Park, Del Paso Heights, and South Sacramento. But if you ever expect things to change within your community, within the city, you've got to take a look at these root causes and see what you can do to change the trajectory for people. That's why when she took over as chief, right when the K Street shooting happened, she decided to take a new approach. You know, you really need to understand why violence occurs and what you can do about it. She and Sacramento Police have targeted these areas to truly understand the causes behind violence there and are working with organizations in these communities to address issues. By working with them and in partnership, we're able to really, um, you know, change people's lives. One of Sacramento Police's community partners is Brother to Brother, an organization focused on gang violence prevention and intervention. If you think about it, this past since that shooting, there hasn't been a lot of gang violence throughout Sacramento. And that's a direct result of this collaboration. He knew a number of people involved with the K Street shooting. How was that for you? Difficult. Very, very difficult because a few of those young men were on a path to turning their lives around and getting out of gang violence. It's why he calls Chief Lester's approach brilliant in that it redefines public safety to involve organizations like his. People in, in every neighborhood that are respected by their neighborhood, they're known in their neighborhood, and it's always easier to allow those people to be mediators, so to speak. And to get to the root cause of violence in hopes of preventing violent shootings like the one that happened here on K Street far before they ever happen. It's been a great collaboration because now we're teammates with law enforcement. It's a collaboration he believes is working. And the hardest thing about that is when we're successful at doing what we're doing, nothing happens. So how do you celebrate nothing happening? But celebration also comes in the form of safety. Put simply, should people feel safe coming to K Street, especially at night? Absolutely. You know, I think that you'll find that when you come down here, um, it's just a, uh, it's a really neat scene. This is what Sacramento is about. Light the beat! And it really makes us a very unique city. It is what makes Sacramento, and Sacramento isn't Sacramento without the people. But for those that were there a year ago and witnessed the K Street shooting, the images of that night are still present. I've seen fights, seen unfortunate events, you know, someone gets stabbed or someone gets shot. Um, but this is the biggest one-time event that took place. He hopes people and city leaders will keep victims of that night in their memory while they work to make K Street a place to enjoy. The more we have positive energy in the area, the better it will be downtown and the better the businesses will be and the more it will grow and re recover. Andy Judson joins us for our conversation after the break. Scott, you guys left them out there on that ground for 18 mm -hmm. hours. And the whole time I kept saying, won't you get my baby up off that ground?
Investigative reporter Andy Judson joins us now for our conversation, really taking a look back at one year since the K Street shooting. And Andy, I know that we've talked to a lot of people and really depending on who you ask, you know, people come to downtown for different reasons. Some people say that they feel safe. Some people say they only come if they have to. Some people just don't care. It just depends on who you ask. Yeah, exactly. But I want to ask you, as an economic corridor, and this is something that's been talked about for over a decade, what does the state of downtown Sacramento look like? Can you paint the picture of what we're looking at right now? Sure. Well, I think, first of all, it depends on what time of the day you come. But there's a number of factors that have really contributed to what downtown and specifically K Street is like today. And I know, you know, we're talking about the shooting and how that has developed to where it is today. But a big thing, possibly even bigger than the shooting, is COVID. Mm -hmm, We've seen mm -hmm. so many businesses throughout this area have to close their doors because they just don't have the customer base. And of course, that is a number of the state workers which businesses here rely upon so between those two things they're just not getting the customer base they need and then with the shooting we heard from the general manager of dive bar that they that also really impacted business for a couple of months and something else I want to ask you too you know we're seeing a historic influx of people you know with the Kings winning and a few other things how is law enforcement really keeping the area safe with so many more people coming down now? Yeah, and I asked Chief Lester that specific question, and she said, of course, they always have security for the Kings game in Kate Street, but they're really trying to solve the violence before it happens because there's just not a lot law enforcement can do. If someone is really committed to a crime or to making a shooting happen, but they can start it by they can stop it by starting at the root cause by getting into the community-based organizations and within those communities to really start it before anything happens. So the prevention tactics, those are what's really key. Exactly. All right, Andy, thank you so much. We Thanks for that. having me. All right, after the break, we are live with our very own Luke Clary, the first reporter on the scene of the K Street shooting. That's after the break. Because we've been with this family since day one. We've sat in the family's living room. We've looked at Sergio's baby pictures. He was a real life person. I will never ever see my baby again. All I have is memories, but I'm gonna let her memory continue to live to help other victims' families continue to heal. So hopefully this will never ever happen again. I'm my justice for my daughter. I'm the justice. I'm the one that stay out here all night to let you know that she's never will, will never be forgotten. John Alexander says that he stayed on K Street all night the night his 21-year-old daughter, John Taya Alexander, was shot, asking for her to get up. But she never did. He did the same last night, sitting on K Street from sunset to sunrise by a memorial that he created for his baby girl who died a year ago today. And he struggled to leave that spot where his daughter took her last breath and hopes that every day is a reminder for the city to think twice before pulling the trigger that could take a life. And John says that he will forever be the voice for his daughter, but also for others who lost their lives. So I want to go ahead and bring in our Luke Clary. He is at tonight's vigil. And Luke, you were live to go first on the scene, and it's been an emotional moment for so many families. What is being said tonight? Hi, Alex. Yeah. An emotional moment here for the families gathering together to mourn the loss of their loved ones. Uh, it appears that this event is starting to wrap up now, although I'm not sure if they'll remain here uh, in more of a candlelight vigil over the next uh, several minutes or half an hour or so. But in any case, um, we heard from some community organizations. We heard from the family of Sergio Harris, who was one of the men who died here. Uh, and what we heard were a lot of expressions of pain, of sadness and of actually frustration and anger as well. Uh, this family saying that they believe that uh, their loved one, Sergio Harris, has been lumped into uh, a narrative ar around gang violence rather than looking at this more as a, a mass shooting. And uh, the, just as, as more details have come to light, they feel that um, the compassion and the outpouring of support from the community has drifted away, Alex.
and Luke, John Alexander, I'm sorry, Alex, I'm, uh, victim's yeah. father, John Te John Taya's dad, actually, uh, said that he is the justice for his daughter in keeping her memory alive. Is there a sense of justice or change out there tonight? Yeah, Alex. So I asked Pamela Harris, the mother of Sergio Harris, what justice would mean to her. What would accountability look like to her? And would that include the conviction of the three men accused of committing the shooting here? Uh, she said they're going to be convicted. That, that's what she believes. But the, you know, when it comes to a matter of, of justice here, uh, the issue that, she, that she's most concerned with is the, the concern around how her, how her son is being painted, the, the father of her grandchildren and the reputation here, um, and, and just the, uh, the various community organizations saying that what really matters now when it comes to accountability and solutions is getting the funding and resources to uh, you know those high-risk communities, those communities impacted most by gun violence. Alex. All right, thank you, Luke. And we are hearing from so many of you a year after the K Street shooting. We will have your points a little bit later in the show. But first, here are some other stories that people are also talking about today. Former President Trump has arrived in New York City ahead of his arraignment on criminal charges tomorrow. What those charges actually are will remain sealed until tomorrow. His attorney says that he will plead not guilty. And Governor Newsom wrapped up we can't a weekend solve a full of appearances in states like identifying. Mississippi and Arkansas. He says extremist Republicans are threatening democracy, so he's pledging to boost Democrats in the reddest states, but he says that he's not using taxpayer dollars to do it. And there was a whole lot of snow recorded at Phillips Station today for DWR's snow survey. They recorded more than 126 inches of snow. That's more than two times the amount we usually see this time of year, and that's the largest ever recorded at Phillips Station. But despite all this snow, we are getting ready to warm up. Thankfully, we saw a lot of sunshine today. Let's get things over to Brendan for a quick check of our weather. Yeah, it's the uh, first full week of April, Alex, and we're still looking at some snow showers up in the Sierra right now. So radar a little bit active, but the valley's dry. We've had a lot of sunshine. There's a little bit of cloud cover out there right now, but uh, I do want to emphasize there's still a little bit of snow up there in the Sierra. It's also been windy today, still windy out there. Winds about 15 mile an hour sustained gusts. We're still looking at 20 to 25 mile per hour gusts. Wind advisory continues for the next couple of hours. So as we go through the rest of this evening, winds will die down, but there's not going to be any cloud cover and that lack of wind will really allow us to cool off overnight. Tomorrow morning, we're going to be starting off in the middle 30s across much of the valley. So a frost advisory remains in effect for Tuesday morning. The average low for this time of year is 46 and we're nowhere near that tomorrow. We're also nowhere near our average high. We're going to be 60 degrees for a high temperature tomorrow under sunny skies. The average high is 69. So a sunny, mild day tomorrow in the valley. I know it's spring break, so lots of good weather out there to get out there and enjoy things. Also, Rivercats home opener is tomorrow. 58 degrees for first pitch, but bring a jacket. will be down to 50 degrees by the final out. High pressure will build in by the time we get to the end of this week, though. We're going to be much warmer. In fact, we're looking at more 70 degree days, potentially some days with 80 by the time we get towards about Easter, but still lots of uncertainty here. Keep an eye on the forecast. Bottom line, some good weather ahead. More news after the break. A year after the K Street shooting, we've been asking you, what changes do you want to see downtown? So here are what some viewers wrote into us and said. One viewer said in part, downtown Sacramento should use a well-trained volunteer Sacramento Peace Corps type of organization with pairs placed throughout the problem areas of the city in order to monitor, report, and prevent possible crimes from occurring or from gathering momentum. Another viewer wrote in and said, downtown Sacramento should put metal detectors in all late night bars, clubs, and restaurants. We also had another viewer who said in part hire youth from underserved communities to help keep downtown streets clean and beautiful as well as help clean up graffiti, but pay them well. Allow youth with musical backgrounds to perform on the streets throughout downtown area during summer months. And we also had another viewer who wrote in and said downtown Sacramento should have more police and keep prosecuted people in jail. As always, thank you so much for sharing your ideas and your thoughts. And before we go, I do want to say I do remember being at the hospital after the shooting, 
checking on how the victims were doing and having to report on events like this. These are the worst days for journalists, for our communities, and for our society. But to all of our Northern California family, I hope you know that we do stand for you and thank you so much for sharing your stories and also for trusting us. I hope you have a great night. We'll see you tomorrow. Hey, it's Alex. Just wanted to say thank you so much for watching. I really love hearing from everyone and I hope that you'll stay in touch. Reach out to me on Facebook at Alex Bell TV, or you can email me at to the point at abc10.com, or you can even send me a text message at 916-321-3310.